All right, so in Acts chapter 20, now we're finishing off in Acts 19, there was this big uproar where they had, um, they had got a couple of the disciples and they brought them into the theater and the whole town is in an uproar and they're saying, you know, there's this big mob and they're saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians and just, they're just having this, this big, um, it's really just like a big mob and because um, they were upset because the disciples were out preaching Christ and they made all their gain and all their money by making the fake idols and all these trinkets and all these altars and all these things that they would made for their God. So when people actually started turning to Christ, they were rejecting that stuff. And they were getting upset about that. That was in chapter 19. And then there was this whole uproar. And then um, I think it was you know, the, the deputy or the magistrate comes in and, he's, and he kind of calms the crowd down and just says, Look, these guys haven't broken any laws. If they've broken any laws, you know, tell the deputies about it and, and you can go to law with each other. Otherwise, you know, we're getting out of hand here, and he kind of he kind of quells the the big uproar, and everyone goes away. So now that's where we are in chapter twenty. It says, and after the uproar was ceased, in verse one, we're we're, we're done with that uproar. It says Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for going to Macedonia. So he leaves Ephesus and he goes into Macedonia, and when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation. He came into Greece. So he's there, he preaches to them, he exhorts them, and he, then now he's moving on to Greece. Verse 3, and there abode three months, and there abode, uh, excuse me, and there abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail to Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sobater, Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Segundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus of and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. So all these people now are, are accompanying Paul in his journeys and his travel to these different churches and preaching the gospel and you know starting up churches. And he's mainly he's mainly going around and visiting churches that have already he's already started and kind of exhorting them and preaching to them and just giving them more wisdom and, and helping them out a little bit. So now he's got a lot of people here in his company. And then look at verse five. It says these going before tarried for us at Troas. Now up to this point in the book of Acts. The narrator of the book of Acts has been has been treating everything like in the third person, like talking about Paul did this, Paul did that, and these other people did this and that. Now we see for the first time in verse 5, it says, um, he's going before tarried for us at trust. So now we see that the narrator is included in the story. And um, we're going to see that for, for at least the next few chapters. And of course, the book of Acts, I believe, is, is written by Luke. And um, you can get that from the, the beginning of, in Acts 1. I went over that, why, why I believe that, that Acts was written by Luke. But um, So here, it's not that big of a deal. Here we're just seeing that now he's joining the company. And it's interesting with God's Word, you know, he's able to record all of these events that happened and, and, and statements that are made, and he, and he has the exact words, yet he wasn't even there. And the reason being is because Luke's not really the author of Acts. God is the author of Acts. And that's the way the whole Bible is written. I mean, you think about the, the book of Genesis, right? I mean, God used Moses to pen down the book of Genesis. Was Moses there when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden? No, of course not. I mean, all those stories, I mean, you have these conversations with Abraham and with and all these things that are going on. It's all recorded for us in the Bible. But see, those people were, were long gone by the time Moses actually penned down what, what really happened and everything that happens because God revealed that unto him and God used him and God authors the Bible. And that's what we believe, God, that God's word is perfect, it's inerrant, he's preserved it for us today. That's why men like Luke or, or you know, Moses or whoever God uses is able to, to, with authority and with accuracy, write down all the events that happen because God's the one who really writes the Bible. They're just the human instrument. God has used their hand or, or um, their, their voices, really, to, um, to be able to preach this word. And usually, in, you'll find in the Bible too, it's not even like Paul who's doing the actual writing. Someone else is doing it. He's speaking it. He's dictating it and someone else is writing it down. You'll see near the end of all the epistles of Paul and stuff, um, like in one of them he says, you see uh, how, how long a letter I have written with my own hand. That was like one of the rare times he was actually doing the writing. Usually it's someone else that's kind of taking it for him. Um, Anyways, that's just a little bit of a side note with, with just the Bible and how we see here in verse 5, Luke is now um, is joining the band. He's, he's joining up with Paul, and now he's going to continue on. You'll see that it's us, and we did this instead of, instead of they and them. 
Uh, verse number six, it says, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. Excuse me, verse seven. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So here we see the disciples coming together on the first day of the week. And this is something that's very common, especially throughout, throughout the book of Acts. You see the meeting time of disciples getting together, and getting together, breaking bread, is on the first day of the week. And that's why we have church on Sunday. That's the reason why, you know, it's not just a tradition. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, how come you don't have church on the Sabbath? So we don't have church on the Sabbath. The disciples met on the first day of the week, which according to our calendar is Sunday. And um, I also believe, you know, one of the reasons why we meet on the first day of the week, or one of the reasons why they were, um, met on the first day of the week, you know, God deserves our first fruits. God deserves the first of everything. You know, I mean, God deserves the tithe, which is the first 10% of our income, our increase. That belongs to God. That's why I, I firmly believe in, in waking up in the morning and reading the Bible first thing in your day. Um, you know, the first day of the week, we go to church, and we kind of give God our best. We give God our first. We put God first in our life. Whatever it is, when we have to make decisions, we should always be putting God first. And any, anything, any decision you have to make, think, well, how does this line up with the Bible? How does this line up with God? And, and that should be our primary focus. And not to say you don't have other focuses or other concerns or other things going on. I mean, we have six other days in the week. But, but you know, let's give our first, let's give our best to God. Um, not that you should just ignore God the rest of the week. But just, you know, let's give Him, let's make sure that we dedicate that first one to Him. Um, we see here, like I said, in the book of Acts, the disciples met on the first day of the week. They break bread together. And then Paul preaches unto them. We see all this in, in verse 7. And um, he was planning on leaving in the morning. It says he continued his speech until midnight. So that's some long preaching, right? <laughs> but, um, but I'll tell you what, you know, Paul had a lot to say. I, I'm, I, I think that would have been awesome to sit under the preaching of Paul. You know, and I hope you don't get, you know, bored and just like looking at your watch all the time when you're sitting in church going like, man, when is this thing going to be over? You know, I mean, especially if you had someone like Paul preaching to you. Know, I'm not, I'm sure, anywhere even close to, to a preacher like Paul was. But... Um, you know, we ought to be hungering and thirsting to hear God's word. And even if the man behind the pulpit, the man doing the preaching, isn't the most eloquent or, you know, isn't the best preacher in the world, we ought to be paying enough attention to try to just glean what you can from God's word, have a love of God's word. Don't just be looking, well, when are we going to get out of here? How soon will we out of here? I mean, Paul preached until midnight. And I, I would have loved to just be sitting there like, keep on going, Paul. You know, like, like let's, let's keep this going. Let's, keep, let's listen to what you got to say. He had a lot to say, obviously. He had a lot that was on his heart, and he was preaching unto him, exhorting him. And he was, it says here he's preaching till midnight. Verse number 8 says, And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. So they're in this, they're in this um, you know, either a house or some kind of building. They're all gathered together, breaking bread. It says in verse 9, And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. So here they are, you know, they're having their church service, Paul's preaching, and obviously he's preaching for a long time. I mean, he's going from dinner time, probably around like 6 o'clock, all the way till midnight. I mean, he's got hours and hours of preaching going on here. And um, <coughs> it says there was a man, he was sitting in a window. So I assume the place was probably pretty packed, you know, but this guy's sitting in the window. He's just, he falls asleep. It's just, it's too much for him. You know, he gets tired, and, and Paul's still preaching and preaching and preaching. This guy falls asleep, and he ends up falling out of the window. And it says they're, they're on the third loft. So we know that he must have fallen out to fall down from the third loft, because if he was inside, you know, even just to get to the window, he, would, he wouldn't have fallen very, very far. And it says they took him up, um, it says in verse 10, and Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And um, so they thought he was dead. He was taken up dead, verse 9. Paul goes to him and he's like, okay, don't trouble yourself. You know, this guy's still alive. Now, what we can get from this story, and it's a real interesting story. You know, it names Eutychus by name. And I always pay attention to little details like that. Because why is this little, this little section, this little side story in here? 
You know, there's these, these little things that are kind of thrown, these details that are thrown in here. You know, nothing in the Bible is there by coincidence. It's not accidental. You know, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for, for doctrine and instruction. And, um, and I'm, I'm going to quote, I'm totally butchering that verse, but we're going to get to it later. Um, everything in the Bible is there for a reason. So I was thinking about this. What could we glean from this, from this story? And one of the things I think we could see here is, I mean, this man literally fell out of church. I mean, literally, right? I mean, he was, he was in a window, he was at a church service, and he fell out. Now, I think we could take that and take that a little bit more figuratively. You know, people fall out of church all the time. And we see, what was he doing? He was sitting in a window. He was probably back, you know, kind of away from the crowd, all the way on the outskirts. He wasn't fully in. Maybe he was kind of sitting like, like half in church, kind of half out of church. Not fully paying attention, maybe seeing what else is going on. You know, he's by the window and, and just not, not fully in, right? And we want to make sure that this never happens to us because people never fall into church, right? I mean, you always fall out. You always hear about people falling out of church. And you have to be careful and be mindful that you don't let that happen to you. And I mean, it was a big deal when, when Eutychus fell out of church. They fell out and they thought he was dead. It was a big fall. He fell hard. He was in the right place. He was under the right preaching of Paul. He was where he should have been, but he let himself fall out of church. And we don't want to let that happen to ourselves because oftentimes, hey, church is where you're going to need to be. You want to strengthen yourself. You want to be edified. You want to grow. You want things to start going better in your life. You want to just, just you know, get on the right path for God. You fall out of church. You get away. You forsake the assembling of the believers. You're going to have a big fall. It's not going to be good for you. And it's going to, it might take you a while then to get back up and, and to get back to where you were. Um, you know, let's not be a Eutychus who, who's here and he, you know, he falls asleep. And I think there's a, there's a couple other things we can get from this too. I look at verse number 8. It says, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. So the church, it says there was many lights. It was a, it was a, it was a church that was bright. And um, again, kind of symbolic I believe, you know, the church is supposed to be the lighthouse in a dark world. We're supposed to be spreading the light of the gospel. Um, the Bible says that we're children of light. We should walk as children of light. And um, turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because I kind of made this connection here with, between the lights in the upper chamber and Eutychus falling asleep and being in a deep sleep. Um, it made me think of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're talking about the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 1. Give me a second to get there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Keep your finger in Acts 20. We're going to be right back there. But 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, in verse number 1, the Bible says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And we see Eutychus was not watching, he was not being sober, he was sleeping as others do. You know, they sleep at night. Think, you know, again, kind of talking about the world. Hey, don't get involved with what the world's doing. Don't get involved with all the cares and the, and the riches and the money and all these other things that could distract you and what so many other people who aren't in church are focused on and that they're living their life for. Because when you start getting that way, you're going to end up being more like these children of the, of the night and you're going to end up falling into a sleep. You're not going to be watching and sober. You're going to fall out of church. When you let that be your focus, it's going to drag you out. It's going to let you fall out of church. Um, it says in verse 7, it says, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to walk as children of light. Church is a place where you should get that type of light, that truth, 
the light of the gospel. We need to bring that out to the dark world. We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to just be aware and, um, and stay awake and, and, um, and just not let yourselves get caught up in the darkness of this world because with the darkness, you're gonna, spiritually you're going to fall asleep and you're going to fall out of church. And you don't want that to happen to you. But let's continue reading here in the book of Acts. In, um, in verse number 11, so we see Paul takes him up. He says, don't worry, you know, his life is still in him. He's okay. He, he wasn't seriously injured. And verse 11 says, when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. So they take this guy up. You know, he's able to sit and eat. Paul's there. He eats. And he basically, they're up all night. So he's, he was there. They had their church service. He's preaching. He's preaching until midnight. This event happens. They're up. They still they decide to have breakfast. You know, might as well have another meal now before Paul gets on the road. And, um, and think about that, too. Paul was a hard worker. Paul was not worried about... I mean, he had to leave in the morning. He knew it. He, he already had his plans to go. He could have been like, okay, guys, I got to cut this short. I need to get some rest. I got a long trip tomorrow. And would anyone really hold him, you know, like responsible and be like, what are you thinking, Paul? Of course not. I mean, you'd be understanding and say, well, yeah, of course, you got a long journey tomorrow. You know, you got a lot to do. Go get some rest. But that's not the type of man that Paul was. Paul was a hard worker. He was dedicated. He was completely sold out to serving God. He was willing to allow himself to get tired. He was willing to allow himself to go through all the trials and tribulations and the things that he went through to serve Christ. I mean, you think about Jesus Christ was, was the perfect example. He was always out. I mean, he was out, you know walking around, preaching to people out in the mountains. Then he'd go by himself apart to pray. Then he'd come back. He was always moving and working. I mean, you never hear about Jesus Christ resting. You never hear about Jesus resting. He was always working. He, had a, he knew he had a short time to do his Father's will, and he kept walking and working. And even, you know, when his, when his disciples were out getting food, and he said, he told them, you know, I have meat that you know not of. Um, when he was, you know, he's preaching to the to the woman at the well, and they didn't understand what he's saying, but but you know, God's feeding him. God's God's going to allow him to continue moving forward. You read about people like Moses, how he, you know, he was in the mountain with God forty days and forty nights, and he didn't eat or drink for those forty days and forty nights. He was just in that mountain with God, real close to God, speaking to God face to face. Hey, that's amazing. When you're doing great works for God, don't worry about your your flesh and the physical needs that you have. God will take care of you. Now, I understand. Look, at some point, we all got to get some sleep. <laughs> it's going to happen. But don't let that deter you. Don't get into this, into this mode where you're like, oh, I, I don't really feel like going out and so I just, I just don't feel like it. You know, I'm, I've got the sniffles or it's a little cold outside or it's a little warm outside. Hey, tell that to the person that, that's going to die and go to hell next week or today or tomorrow. Who knows? When you're walking in God's will, I mean, you could say, well, but it's 105 degrees outside. You know how hot it is in hell? Seriously, I mean, look, don't let the weather, don't let these little things keep you back from serving God. Now, again, we have some type, you have to be careful with our bodies. You have to, you know, I'm not saying just, just, just completely run yourself ragged all the time. You can't, you can't sustain yourself. You have to be wise with your health. Right, but but what I'm saying is that don't let the smallest things just keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, a little bit of rain or a little bit of cold or a little bit of hot. Look, pull it together, man. And just, <laughs> especially if you're a man. Okay, ladies, I don't expect ladies to be doing as much you know the hard work and, and going through as much of the um, you know with with the with the with the climate or whatever when things are, are kind of rough. And harder to do, but the men, I expect you to do that. I mean, if you had to work, you'd be out, you'd be out working for a paycheck, right? I mean, you do what you got to do to support your family and to provide. Hey, you better be working at least that hard for God, if not harder. And um, don't don't let the slightest thing, the slightest excuse, come by for you to just say, "Yeah, I don't feel like doing that." Oh, oh you know, it was a real late night last night, and, and I had to work real late, and I only got like four hours of sleep. I'm not going soul anymore. I'm not going to read my Bible today because I had all these other things going on and, and now I just got to sleep. That's, that is a poor attitude. You, have. you ought to put God first. That's why I said, you know, um, let something else suffer. Let other things that you have going on suffer. But be willing to put in your work and your time with God because He should be the most important thing in your life. But let's continue reading here. And um, 
It says in verse 13, And he went before to ship and sail into Assos, there intending to take in Paul. For so had he appointed mining himself to go afoot. So here we see, <laughs> not only is it, you know, he was up preaching all night and everything else, he didn't even go into the boat. He wanted to go on foot. That's what it says at the end of verse 13. It says, For so had he appointed, so he appointed them when they had sailed into Assos. He said he appointed them to meet him, mining himself to go afoot. Paul was a man who was in good shape. I mean, he was able to, to, to walk. And this is a little bit later in his life. I don't know exactly how old he is, but, but he decided, you know what? I'm just going to walk it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk. I've been up all night. I'm just going to go probably get alone with God and, and spend some, some, some good time um, in prayer and meditation and um, in walking on foot. And then verse 14, it says, And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in. So there he, get, he goes into the ship and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogillium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So Paul's really got his heart, he really got his mind. He wants to make it back to Jerusalem. You know, he's stopping by, he's going to all these different cities, all these different places. And we saw it in, in um Chapter 19, he was just in Ephesus. Now, I don't know how much time has gone by in between. I'm sure quite a bit of time because he's hitting all these different places. It takes time to travel. He's spending some time with them and preaching and stuff. Yet, he's got a goal now. and He's like, I want to be at Jerusalem, so I'm not going to stop at Ephesus. So what he did, it says in, um, in verse 17, it says, And from Miletus, so here he is in Miletus. He didn't want to stop in Ephesus. He sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So instead of going there and preaching to the church, and, and, and doing what he's been doing in all these other towns, he calls for the elders. He calls for the pastors of the church at Ephesus and says, okay, well, why don't you guys come here to me? I'm in my latest. You know, I, I don't have enough time to go there and do everything that I would do. So you guys come to me. And this is where we're at here in verse number 18. It says, and when, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you, at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. So now, while well, I point out here, Paul's not a person that, that put on a show with people. He says there in verse 18, um, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you, at all seasons. Right? So from the very from day number one, when Paul got into Asia, from day number one, he starts. He says, you knew what type of person I was. You can see what manner of man I was from the very first day at all seasons. It doesn't matter whether he was popular, whether he was unpopular, whether there was people persecuting him, no matter what came his way. He says, you know what manner of man I was from day one. He wasn't this type of person who's just going to put on a show. He wasn't trying to deceive people. You know, there's so many churches these days that will compromise on their positions just to try to bring people in. They'll, they'll, they'll start compromising. See, we're an old-fashioned church. We like to do things the old-fashioned way. That's why we sing the old hymns. That's why we, you know, we, we do hard preaching. That's why we read chapters of the Bible. We do a lot of scripture. Um, there's so many of the things that we do are well thought out. And, and we're not going to compromise on any of our positions. We're not going to compromise on the music. We're not going to compromise on anything just so that we can try to bring more people in and just kind of fake it or tone it down and, and kind of hold back some of the truth from people because we don't want to offend them and we just want to bring them in. Hey, that's not the type of person Paul was and that's not the type of person that I am and that's not the type of person that you ought to be either. Paul didn't change with the times. He didn't go with whatever was popular and just preach that. He was the same in all seasons. He also didn't hide the fact that serving God is going to come with trials and temptations. He says in verse um, in 19, he says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. He's like, you saw what happened. People were lying and the Jews were lying in wait for him. That means they were just ready to, to, to bring a trap on him. They were, trying to, they were out to get him. They were bringing these trials. They were bringing these temptations. They were, they were going after him. They were trying to arrest him. They were beating him up. They were doing all these things to get him to stop preaching. They were attacking him. And he says, you know, he didn't hide that. He, but he, rather, he warned people. 
He says, yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The persecution's going to come. Hey, I'm not going to hide that from you. If you're going to sell out, if you're going to go completely on fire for God, if you're going to be a preacher of righteousness, if you're going to do what's right, if you're going to stand up against this world, if you're going to stand up against the devil, if you're going to stand up against these attacks, and you're going to do what's right and just say, this is my authority, I'm not going to back down, if that's what you're going to do, there are going to come persecutions. There's going to come trials. The more godly, the more separated you live, the more godly you are, the more you're going to get attacked. The more the devil's going to hate you, he's going to know you by name, and he's going to, and he's going to attack you. And it's going to come. And to some people, that may be scary. And I can understand that, but you ought to have more faith in God because God can protect you. We don't need to be fearful. I preached on this last week. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. There's nothing that we need to be afraid of. If you're going to sell for God, hey, expect the attack. Know it's going to come. Because you don't want it to you have it just blindside inside you and, and you don't know what hit you. When you expect it, you can be ready. You can put on the whole armor of God and prepare yourself and understand that, hey, these things are going to happen so that when it does happen, you can stay strong. You can say, okay, I'm going through a tough time right now. I knew it was going to happen, but I'm going to make it through this. I've got my faith in God. It's not just taking me by surprise. We can make it through this. And when you make it through those hard trials, you're going to come forth even stronger and, 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 and better. And, um, you know, Paul didn't hold that back from people. He let them know, hey, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. He, he made sure that it, was, that it was known abroad. Now, there's also a lot of churches that will have you think that, that you have to ease people into church. And they have all these different programs that I've heard of, like, you know, people starting. And, and I've got some advice from different people. I've heard different people there with their approaches in starting churches. Because this church, we're starting from scratch. We started with, with nobody but my family in this church. Just going around, knocking on doors, and trying to get people in. And of course, um, Sebastian and Michelle moved down here too when they found out we were starting this church. But, um, you know, we're starting from scratch. And a lot of people will tell you, well, in the beginning, you should just start with one service. And, uh, you know, we have three services. We've always had three services. We have a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, and a Wednesday night. But I've heard people that, that go out, you know, they, they try to give advice on people starting churches. They'll say, well, just start with one. Because you need to at least just, it's hard enough getting one, you got to get people used to just coming to church just for that Sunday morning. It's like, then you start, then you start introducing, you know, the Wednesday night. So then you have a Sunday night and a Wednesday night, and then you introduce the Sunday night. I don't remember, maybe I got those out of order. But they try to, to do this to like, ease people in. And they'll also tell you, the same people have this type of approach, they'll say, well, in the Sunday morning, you know, you shouldn't really preach that hard. Don't bring up all the, you know, all the, the, the doctrine that's going to be divisive. Don't bring up this stuff because when people are just coming on Sunday morning, usually that's when your visitors are going to come. Usually that's when people who are new to church are going to come. You don't want to scare them away. You, know, you don't want them to get offended right away. You want to try to bring them in and get them here for a while. And you can still preach the hardest stuff. I'm not telling you not to preach the hardest stuff, but just do that on like a Sunday night or on a Wednesday night when it's more just the core people who are dedicated to serving God. And, I, and I, we don't do that here. That is not the way I do it here. Because I'll tell you what, I'm not going to hold back anything from anybody. I mean, if you're someone that's going to come here only on Sunday morning, hey, you're going to need to hear the truth just as much as everyone else. I'm not going to hold back from you something that's going to be profitable. And Paul didn't either. Look at verse number 20. It says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, Paul kept back nothing that was profitable. I don't care what time it is, if it's in the morning, if it's in the evening, if it's a Wednesday night, whenever you come around, I'm not going to hold anything back. Nothing is too hard. Hey, if it's hard, the only reason why preaching is hard to anybody is because they got their mind just brainwashed and twisted in this world's mindset anyways. Nothing from the Bible is hard. It's God's work. It's truth. It's not hard. It's truth. And I'm not going to hold back truth from people because maybe they haven't been coming here very long. If God's word says something, hey, I'm going to preach it. And you know what? If it's a sin that you're guilty of, then you need to hear it even more. I'm not going to hold it back from you. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and just, and just you know, examine people's lives and be like, what do you need to hear? And just, and just, and just lay into people. 
That's not what I'm here for. But at the same time, I'm not going to hold back being like, well, here's a great truth from the Bible that needs to be preached. Oh, but so-and-so I know is in that sin. So I'm not going to preach on that. No way. No way. If God's laid on my heart to preach something, guess what? I'm going to preach it. And if someone, like, I'll give you a perfect example. Because this is so kind of, this is so easy. You know, the Bible talks about the length of our hair. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about how men should have short hair and women should have long hair, right? There's half a chapter that's entirely dedicated to this. It's a truth in the Bible. You, can, you talk to me after service, you haven't heard this. But um, if someone, if I were to preach a sermon on that topic, as an example, and a man were to walk in, and he had, and he had long hair, right? And it's the first time coming to church. I'm not going to change the sermon at all. That's the last thing I'm going to do. Because what I'd rather believe is that hey, maybe this is exactly what this guy needs to hear. He's not right with God. This is something that's going to be important. Now, now maybe after hearing that sermon, he might think, hey, he's picking on me. He saw me walk in and he's preaching this right at me. That's not the case, but, and, and maybe he'll never come back. I don't know. But the thing is, I'm not going to trim the message. I'm not going to hold back the truth because it might offend somebody else. Hey, if it offends him, that's his problem with God. That's not my problem with him. That's his problem with God. If the truth offends you, if what, God, if what God's word says, if that offends you, then you've got the problem with God. Hey, I'm here trying to help you. I want to be able That's why I went to the church I went to because there's a lot of sin that I needed to get out of my life. Hey, there's still sins that need to get out of my life. And if I could find out what those are, I'm going to be happy about that. The Bible says um, in Proverbs... It says, reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase learning. Hey, if you're humble of heart, if you're wise, you're going to want to hear the rebuke. You're going to want to hear what the Bible teaches and what it says, because that way you can get right with God. You can get closer to God. You can get the sins out of your life and grow and, and be able to, to be pleasing in God's eyes. Anyone that could point these, these things out to me, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be glad at that. Now, at the instant that, that you hear it, you might, you might get that initial reaction of like, oh, man, and, and, you, know, you don't like to hear that sometimes. Especially you're doing something for a while, you don't think it's wrong, you think everything's just fine, and then you hear something just, just hammered and preached from the Bible, you have to be humble in order to receive that. You know, some people bristle at that and say, no, I'm not, I'm not doing anything wrong, and try to be a self-righteous. And that's usually when people don't come back because they don't want to admit that, hey, look, this is what the Bible says. Now, if I'm preaching something and it's not lining up with the Bible, then go ahead and, and get mad at me. I hope you don't get mad at me. Maybe you could just, just show me why I'm in error from the Bible. But, um, you know, I can understand that. But if it's what the Bible says, I mean, if it's, if it's just written in black and white, you know, that's, that's a problem that you're going to have to deal with. And see, Paul was the type of man... That, that he didn't hold back. He held nothing back that was profitable. All of God's word is profitable for us. And, and the, the job of the preacher is to, is to preach the word and to, and to, you know, regardless of what it says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, turn if you would there, hold it again, keep your place in Acts 20, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to reread Acts 20 where we were because the same concept is brought up in 2 Timothy 3. In verse 20 of Acts 20, he said, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks' repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a good preacher is not going to hold anything back from you, but let's look at um, Paul's second epistle to Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher. He was giving him advice. And um, in chapter 3, verse number 10, the Bible reads, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So here again, we see it's almost the same exact thing that's going on that was happening in Acts. He's explaining to Timothy. He's like, you've known me. 
You've known my doctrine. You know what manner of man I was. You know my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, what I put up with, the charity that I've given, the persecutions, the afflictions. And he goes on and on about the things that, you know, his, his afflictions. But he says, but out of, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Because Paul was faithful, no matter how bad things looked, I mean, he was stoned, and he was drug out of the city and stoned to death, essentially. They left him for dead, yet God still even delivered him out of that. God, he was shipwrecked. He had all these things happen to him that were really bad things, but God still delivered them out of them all. Now, he went through a lot of pain and suffering. He definitely went through a lot, where a lot of people might just decide to give up. But see, Paul didn't give up. Paul had faith in God, and he said, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Let's look at verse 12 of 2 Timothy 3. It says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I quoted that earlier, and that's a promise. He says all. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus. If you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, he says you shall suffer persecution. It's going to come. Okay, now, we might, in this country, in this day, we might not face the same types of persecution that Paul did in his day. It, you know, it's probably, it's going to happen. It's going to happen at some point. You know, Christians are going to be martyred. We're going to be, we're going to be, you know, and the people that are going to be doing it are, think, are going to be thinking they're doing God's service. Just like the Jews did. I mean, these Jews were, je were jealous. They were zealous for their God. But they didn't believe in the God. They thought they did. They thought they believed in Moses' law. They thought they believed in this. Jesus Christ said, if you, you know, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. But see, they hated Christ. They hated Paul. They thought they were in God's service because they thought Paul was a blasphemer. They thought he was a heretic, just like Jesus Christ. They thought they were doing God's service. And the people that will come and attack the Christians, they're going to think the same exact thing. And they're going to bring this heavy persecution. But I believe even today, the more godly that you live, the more righteous that you live, hey, you're going to suffer persecution. And it's only a matter of time before it's going to get to the same degree that, um, that, that Paul and the, the apostles had to deal with. Let's keep reading here in 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. It says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Again, he's just warning us. And look, the evil men, the seducers, are going to get worse and worse. They're, deceived, they're deceitful. And um, it's going to get worse as time goes on. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The scripture is God's word. All of God's word, he says, is profitable for us to learn doctrine, right? To us to understand and know what the doctrines are of the Bible, but not just for doctrine. He says we need reproof, correction, and instruction. Now, reproof, who knows what reproof is? It's being told you're wrong. How about correction? You're being told you're wrong, right? That's what he's saying here. The Bible, we, yes, we, it's probable for learning doctrine, but it's also for, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, for telling you the right way. So, Two times, reproof, correction, telling you you're wrong, instruction, hey, this is the right way to do it. And that's what, you know, all scripture is given by, and it's all profitable for that. Um, now, the, the reproof and the correction has a tendency to make people upset. It's not always pleasant to hear that you're wrong. It has the potential that some people are going to even leave the church because they don't want to hear the reproof. And that's why we have all these fun centers these days that people can go to, and it's just a social club, and they say, oh yeah, you're, you know, everything's doing great in your life, keep loving God, keep praying, and, and, and everything's just fine, you're doing great. You, you know, don't worry about the sin, we're in the New Testament, we're not in the Old Testament, you know, don't worry about these laws, don't worry about, you know, God was kind of mean in the Old Testament, but He's loving and forgiving and graceful in the New Testament, don't worry about that stuff, you're doing fine, you're doing great. And that's what, what tickles people's ears, they love to hear, you know, that everything's doing just fine and they're doing so well. And that's why we have so many of these liberal churches these days. They go, they have the rock concert, they have all this fun, and then they leave for the week and they just continue on in their, in their sinful life. And nothing ever changes. Because 
they can't handle the rebuke, and it's because the preachers, most of them are up there preaching for filthy lucre's sake, for money. Because they don't want to offend anybody. They want people still coming, throwing their money in the plate, and, and continuing to, to come, and, and he doesn't want to offend anybody. And, um, you know, even though it's not always pleasant to be told about your sin and that you're in sin and that maybe something you're doing is wrong, but if it's in the Bible, if that's what the Bible says, hey, we shouldn't be withheld. All the counsel of God needs to be preached. Everything. We can't just, just pick and choose, well, this is nice. This is good. I mean, last Sunday morning, I preached on forgiveness. Hey, that's a real positive sermon. That's great, right? Praise God for his love and his mercy and, and, and being forgiving. That is absolutely a great aspect of God. Hey, God is love. We want to learn about that. We love him for it. So many positive attributes, but don't just leave off the negative. There are God has also a God of wrath. God created hell. Hell is a place of extreme wrath. That came from God. It didn't just, just pop up on its own. It's definitely not from the devil. The devil's going to be there burning and, and, and tortured with, you know, when he gets thrown into the lake of fire. He's going to be there forever. Um, we have to understand God, and, and the more we understand, the more we get knowledge and learn from Him. You know, the the, the more we could get close to Him, the more we can we can uh, shape up our lives and do what we need to do. We need that kind of preaching, and the reason why we need His preaching, it says here at the end of First um, Timothy or Second Timothy three seventeen, it says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So we get that doctrine, we get that instruction, we get the correction, we get the rebukes, we get the reproof from the scripture so that we can be perfected and truly furnished in order to go out and do, do good works. We need to get the sin out to be used more of God and that we can be truly furnished. Furnished is like, you know, furnishings in a house, right? You're adding more stuff to the house. Hey, the Bible, learning these doctrines, learning this instruction is going to furnish us. It's going to give us the tools. It's going to give us what we need to do all the good works that God expects of us and God commands us to do. Let's flip back now to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> so Paul was, Paul was a man, he kept nothing back. He wasn't afraid of who was going to get upset. And, and you think of any, if anyone was going to get afraid of people who upset, it was going to be Paul. After the first time he got beaten, thrown in jail, right? You might, he might think, now, wait a minute. I've been here before. I, I know when I said this, it really made him angry. Maybe I'll hold back a little bit. Did Paul do that? Not for a second. Absolutely not. He knew he would go into the synagogues. He would go in and preach and, and, and just try to prove because he loved them. He would say, look, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And he proved it from scriptures. And a lot of people hated him for that. They thought he was a heretic. He risked his life on, on many occasions. He received beatings. He, he, he put himself out there, though. He said, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. God was able to deliver him out of all, the, all, of those, all of those struggles. Again, he went through, he, went, he did suffer for, he went through a lot. But God was able to deliver him. So let's keep reading here in verse number 22. It says, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So here, he knows, the Holy, people have been preaching to him and warning him through the Holy Spirit, and, and, and earlier in the book of Acts, have been telling him, hey look, don't go to Jerusalem. There's bonds, there's afflictions, you know, it's not going to be good for you, there's going to be bad things that happen. And every time he receives these warnings, he's saying, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not ready to be bound only, but also to die. It says, look at verse 24. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So, he says there in verse 24, he says that I don't even count my own life dear unto me. You know, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to not go to save my own life. And, um, you know, this is a great attitude that we ought to have. Now, I think he should have heeded some of those warnings, and we'll get into that next chapter. But, um, you know, Paul was selfless. 
He wasn't worried. Even though he knew that there was going to be afflictions, there was going to be trials, he did it anyways. He didn't count his life dear unto himself. He said, I want to finish my course with joy and the mystery which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He was committed to giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it didn't matter what happened to him. He was going to keep preaching it anyways. And that's the type of attitude that we ought to have. To be selfless. To not be so worried about ourselves and what the outcome might be for us. Let's just think about what's going to be outcome for God. And are we going to, and are we going to be profitable for Him. Uh, verse 25 it says, and, um, and, he, and He tells them here, He says, Now behold, I know that all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He says, you guys aren't going to see me anymore. I'm going to go. I'm not coming back. And he, I think he's thinking that this is going to be it. Um, verse 26 is, Wherefore I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. We went into this in another sermon, but he's saying again, look, I'm clean from the blood of all men. And the reason why he's clean, the reason why he could say that, is he says, um, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He said, I have not kept anything back. The reason why he's clean from the blood, because he's preached the truth. Now, when someone hears the truth, it's up to them to decide what they're going to do with it. Just like when we preach the gospel, hey, all I can do is explain and show the verses and just and preach the gospel to people how Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead to save you from your sins. But the choice is yours. What are you going to do with that knowledge? Are you going to accept the truth? Are you going to put your faith in the truth? Are you going to put your faith on Christ? Are you going to believe it? Are you going to receive it? Or are you going to reject it? Hey, I can't make you accept it. But I'm going to do my part. See, once I've done my part, now it's on you. My hands are clean. Now, if I don't do my part, if I don't give the warnings, if I don't preach on sin, if I don't preach all the counsel of God, then guess what? God's going to hold me responsible. If I don't warn my neighbors, if I don't warn my family and friends, if I don't warn people about hell, if I don't warn them about the judgment, hey, that's my fault. I'm not doing my job that God has given to me as a saved, as a born-again Christian, as someone who has the Holy Spirit residing in me. I'm not doing my job if I don't go and warn other people about it. But once I do my job, then I, then I can say like, Paul, hey, my hand, I'm clean of this. I've done my part. It's up to them to decide. And Paul was clean of that. He's, he, and he was bold enough to say that too. He said, I haven't shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I didn't hold anything back. And we ought not to, and you ought never to hold back the Bible because you think someone might not be able to receive it. I mean, if you're having a discussion with someone, hey, the Bible says what it says. We don't, we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We don't need to make excuses for what the Bible says. And these atheists and these God haters will be out there and they'll try to point. To, to, to sections of the Bible, whether it be the Old Testament or whatever portion of God law, and they'll try to, to point and be like, oh, do, do you believe this? Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is just to back down and be like, oh, well, no, I mean, the, and, and try to explain something away when something just says it point blank. Like that the sodomites ought to be put to death. Do you really believe that? Yes, I do, because that's what God's word says. The Bible talks about a rebellious son. We, we read about it um, last week. The Bible says that he ought to be put to death. Someone who curses their father and mother and, you know, and hits them and is a rebellious son and they won't receive correction, they won't re receive reproof. The Bible says, yes, that person ought to be put to death. Hey, I didn't write the Bible, but I believe it. And it gets real quiet when you start preaching on those types of things because people are like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, it's, it's so far off the deep end in today's culture, and there's no churches preaching on it, and nobody's teaching this stuff. But that doesn't mean that God has to change. Just because everyone else is changing around him, God's word is the same as it has been from the foundation of the world. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. Now, you can either accept it or not. You believe it or not. I believe God's word. And I'm not going to hold anything back. We need to know these things. Again, even those, even those, those other laws, those things, don't get taken aback by that. And if the Bible says something, hey, if you don't understand what it says, you could just say, I, you know, I don't understand that. There's nothing wrong with, with not understanding the entire Bible. There's nothing to be ashamed of in that regard. Now, if that comes up, go study it out. Figure it out. Understand what it says. But there's something in it, and it says something plainly, just be like, 
That's what the Bible says, and yes, that's what I believe. That's exactly what I believe. That's what it says. I didn't write it. God wrote it. Don't be ashamed of that. Um, let's continue reading here. It says in, um, so in, in verse 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Reminded, remember, he's still, he's, he's still talking to the, to the elders of, the, of Ephesus, of the church of Ephesus. He's talking to the pastors. He's talking to these people that he called from Ephesus. He's in my latest one. Um, so that's why he's saying take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. The flock would be the congregation, the rest of the church. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. The pastors, the elders that, that are ordained of God. He says, hey, the Holy Ghost has made you overseer. The pastor is the overseer of the church. That's his responsibility. For the people, for the flock that's in that church. He says, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He's saying, your job as a pastor, you need to feed them. You need to, to, to show them and not hold back from God's word. That's the pastor's job. And I'll tell you what. If the pastor's job is to feed the church, what does that tell you, for one, about the importance of coming to church? Right? If the pastor's job is to feed you, if you need to be fed, and that's what one of the jobs is of the pastor in church, don't you think it's kind of important then to come to church so you can be fed, so you can receive that nourishment, so you can receive that manna from the Bible, that word that's going to come in and feed you as, as the pastors are instructed to do to feed the church of God? And if the Holy Ghost is the one that made people overseers of the church, their job is to feed the church, don't you think that you ought to show up once in a while to eat what's being fed, what's being prepared? Because I'll tell you what, if the pastor's doing his job right, they're not just opening up the Bible on, you know, oh, oh, 10.30, man, it's time for church. What am I going to preach on today? And just open up the book and just start, no. There's a lot that goes into this. It gets prepared. It gets prepared throughout the week. It gets prepared throughout a lifetime of reading and memorizing and meditating on Scripture to be able to prepare the meals for the church to say, you know what, there's all these truths here. That's why we flip around to lots of different Scriptures in the Bible so you can see all of it because this has been prepared. All this stuff has been prepared before time to help teach you, to help show you, to help give you a good meal that you can walk out of here and say, man, I've been fed, I've learned something, I'm growing, I'm getting what I need from church. Church is important, don't forsake the assembly. How about this? How about the fact that it says here that Jesus Christ has purchased the church with his own blood? Jesus shed his blood, he purchased the church with his blood. Does that put enough importance on making it to church, you know, even though maybe the big game is on, right? Hey, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not going to make it to church. Jesus Christ shed his blood for the church. And you're just going to forsake it for some stupid game that, that means nothing. Nothing. Or whatever it is. Whatever, whatever the reason, whatever excuse might be why you don't feel like coming to church. Okay? The Bible says that the elders are there to feed you. They're preparing their sport. They should be doing their job. I mean, this, was, this is an admonition to the elders. This is Paul preaching to them specifically, saying, you need to take care of the flock. You need to read the Bible. You need to prepare this meal and to feed them and, and make sure they're getting what they need. That's your job. And, and if you're not the pastor, hey, your job is to come in and partake of that meal. Partake of what's being fed and, and learn from it. And, um, and again, don't just take everything that the pastor says at face value. Just don't, don't just take it all and just believe it because the pastor says it. Study for yourself what the Bible says. Make sure you know for yourself because that's how people get lied and deceived when you don't know for yourself if you just blindly accept everything that comes to you. Look, try it. Make sure that, that what I'm saying, make sure what I'm preaching lines up with what is written right here in the Bible. And I hope everything is. That's the goal. That's what I'm trying to do. But, um, but don't just trust blindly that that's going to happen because it says here in verse um, 29, this is why you don't just accept everything blindly. It says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul's like, hey, when I leave, I already know what's going to happen. The wolves are going to come in. They're going to think, hey, cool, Paul's gone. Now we're going to come in. Now we're going to attack the church. It says not sparing the flock. They're not going to spare anyone. They, there are people in this world. You have to understand this. Look, because most people don't get this. There are evil, wicked people out in this world. And the normal people don't quite get that. It's hard to grasp. 
Because you think, why in the world would anybody want to just willingly like go do something wicked and evil? It doesn't occur. I mean, it doesn't occur to me. It doesn't occur to normal people just to 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 just say, I'm just going to wreak havoc and I'm just going to go and and try to do something evil and just and just split this church and do whatever. But there are people out there. There's wolves out there that are going to do that. That's their goal. Their goal is to split church. Their goal is to mess up families. Their goal is is to do these things. And there's wicked people out. We need to understand that. The Bible says in verse 30, it says, Also of your own selves shall men arise. So even people from within their church, says some people are going to rise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, this is going to happen. You need to understand that. When people start, start, you know, even of your own church, you can't, you know, people like to think, hey, church is a place where you can just trust everybody. But it's not. Now, I'm not saying... You know, you have to be accusing people or really, you know, just just, just being like, I don't know, so that's Sebastian guy. <laughs> it's not like that. But but here's the thing. You, tr you, you know, you give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but you don't have to trust anyone. Trust in God. Okay, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's why, you know, we don't have babysitters for our kids. We don't leave them with strangers. We, we, don't, we don't let anyone else watch them. I mean, hey, it's not to say anything against you. I'm sure you're a nice guy or a nice girl, you know, um, whatever. But when it comes down to it, ultimately, yeah, we, <laughs> I'm not going to trust anyone with something so precious. Now, if, if you want to borrow a book from me, you want to borrow some other thing that I have, okay, you know, I, I don't have something as valuable, you know, that if it's not something I hold that valuable, then sure. Because then when, when you give things away, like it's a good principle to live by, just be ready to say goodbye to it. If you're not, if you're not willing to just, to just not have it anymore, then don't lend it up. Because, especially with, especially with people from church, because you don't want to start, you know, to have some kind of strife or some kind of them hard feelings towards someone in church because, because they wronged you. You know, like, well, I lent you all this money and stuff, and you didn't pay me back, and now you're having this, this struggle and this strife over, over something stupid. I mean, really, money. Like, I understand we all, need, we all need some kind of money to survive and get by, but, you know, that ought not to be something that gets between you and a brother or sister in Christ. And um, if you're not willing to just to just part with it, then don't lend it out. You know, don't don't give it, don't do it. But um, anyways, I'm kind of digressing here from 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 the point of sermon here. Oh yeah, um, don't trust everything the pastor says either, because hey, you need to watch out for for the grievous wolves. Now, <laughs> you have a desire yourself if you think that that I'm up here just trying to deceive people, right? Um, that's not my goal or intent. But you still you you can only know that for yourself. You can only know that for sure. I mean, you can't just trust completely, just be like, um, you have to be able to decide it for yourself. Ultimately, ultimately, at the end of the day, the response is going to fall on your own shoulders anyways. You can't just use an excuse, even with God, and say, well, God, I was deceived, because look at what happened with Eve in the Garden of Eden. She says, I was deceived by the serpent, right? Yet she still got punished for it. He didn't hold her guiltless. Now, he punished the serpent, too, for deceiving her. But Eve also received a punishment. And so did Adam. I mean, they all, they all received a punishment. They all had their own individual responsibility. And that's what it's going to come down to with us. Now, um, obviously, if someone's teaching lies and deceits, get away from that person. You don't, you don't need to hear that. But it's going to happen. I mean, especially not now, probably, as the church is really young, but as the church starts to grow, you know, as we get more people, I'm sure there's going to be people trying to rise and, and, and speak perverse things and trying to draw people away, trying to split the church, especially if the church is doing a lot of good things for God. Hey, the devil's going to come and try to attack. He's going to try to get people out. He's going to try to, to, to split it up and, and cause division in the church. And um, we just need to be aware of these things. That's why he says in verse uh, 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Hey, this was a big warning. This was an admonition from Paul. He's, he's, he was serious. He says, for three years, night and day, I mean, with tears, he couldn't express enough the warning. He said, watch out for these devils. Watch out for these wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to come to you looking nice, but watch out for them. And the only way you're going to be able to watch is if you're sober, if you're a, children of, a child of light, and if you're getting the light of the gospel, getting the light of God's word in you, and you're getting that knowledge, you're gaining that wisdom, you're getting God's word, you'll be able to spot the stuff easier. You'll be able to spot the deceiver. 
you'll be able to, to see and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what they're saying doesn't line up. Because most of the false doctrine out there, I'll tell you what, people make it sound real good, especially the real slick ones out there, right? I mean, these people that are teaching heresy and these false doctrines, they'll be able to show you a couple verses. And they'll say, see, look, the Bible says this and this. Now, if you're not that grounded, if you're not that solid, if you don't really know what the Bible says, it's real easy to get caught up in this stuff because usually it's also stuff that you like to hear anyways. It, just, it sounds good. It sounds great. Hey, yeah. Cool. That's, you know, that, and that's what the Bible says. Great. And you, and you just get sucked in. And that's how people get sucked in is because they're ignorant. Because they don't know the Bible for themselves. They're relying on their pastor. They're relying on someone else. Instead of relying on themselves to just, just do the study. Hey, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some time. You can't learn the Bible overnight. It's going to be precept upon precept, line upon line. you got to read. You're going to get here a little, there a little. But it's going to come together. And you just can't stop. It's something you need to be diligent with. You need to read the Bible every day. You just need to, over time, over the course of years... Right? This is how the Christian life is run. This is how it's led. It's a marathon. You need to just, just do it slowly. Do it continually. Day after day after day. And before you know it, you look back and be like, oh wow, you know, I've, I've read the Bible five times already. But it's not going to happen overnight. It's definitely not something that's going to happen you know, in, in one sitting or in, or in one week. You can, you know, you're going you're gonna to have to just, just make sure you're, you're, you're sticking with it. And... Um, you know, we need to be aware of this. Paul, Paul admonished people, he said, night and day with tears. It's extremely important. It's, it's a, this is a, a very heavily worded, you know, admonition to watch. And remember, hey, these people are going to come in, they're going to speak perverse things, they're going to try to draw people away. They're going to try to split the church and say, hey, well, come follow me. Oh, this pastor doesn't know what he's talking about, come follow me. And they're going to be in the church trying to do that and draw people away and split the church. It's happened over and over, countless times. It happens all the time, unfortunately. And, um, we need to be aware of that. Be aware the devil's out there trying to do this stuff. And it only is going to make sense for him to try to send infiltrators in to draw people away. I mean, the devil's going to send people in. And I've seen it in my other church where, where people come in, they, they, they look right. They wear the nice clothes. They say the right words. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. And, you know, they carry their Bibles. But after, after some time, it, all, it almost always comes out. I mean, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. They can put on a show for a while, and 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 they get and basically what they're doing is trying to earn people's trust, earn people's confidence, and then once they think they have it, once they have enough people, that's when the that's when when their heart starts coming out, and that's when they start doing their damage, and that's when they start just you start hearing this the, the perverse teachings and stuff of people trying to trying to get um trying to get the people out. And um, we just need to remain vigilant. We need to watch. We need to be sober, and just just understand that it's going to happen. I mean, it's 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 part of the Christian life. You know, again, don't you don't need to be like <laughs> suspecting everyone in church. Like <laughs> it's you, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm picking on smashing knife. But uh, <laughs> you don't have to have that type of attitude. Just 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 know that it's there, right? And, and if you know the Bible for yourself, then, then you won't have to worry as much about it because you can, you'll be able to spot it and, and not get sucked into it. So let's finish up the chapter here. Look at verse number um, 32. It says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. He's, so he's saying here, he's explaining that um, he did his own work. You know, he could have received money from them. It, it would have been legitimate because he was preaching the gospel and he was doing the work of God. And it would have been just fine for him to receive money and receive payment for what he's doing from the people there to support him. But what he did was he said, no, I worked. He said, I provided for myself and the necessity of those that are with me. Said, you guys didn't have to do anything. But he, and he did it for a reason. It says in verse 35, he says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. He was teaching them a lesson. He said, you can see how hard I'm laboring. Paul labored. I mean, he labored night and day. He did his work, his, his manual labor job. He was building tents and, and, you know, and doing the stuff that he did. He provided for him. He provided for those of his company. And he preached God's word. And he went out and won souls. 
And he did all of this work. I mean, that's a lot of labor for one man to do. And people can see that, recognize that, and say, hey, here's a hard-working man. Again, you see someone like that, it's going to make you think, and I think I don't have time to read the Bible, you know what I mean? Like, you got a guy working full-time, doing all this other stuff, and then you're going to make excuses for why you can't do something for God? And not only that, he says um, that you ought to support the weak, you know, people who are weaker. Um, you know, Paul was strong. He was a strong Christian. He was strong in the Lord. And he was showing them by example how he would support the weak. He would support other people. And to remember, he said the word of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Don't be worried about what you can come and get. You know, whether it be from this church, whether it be from other things, like, don't be so focused on, well, what can I get from this? What do I get out of this? But also, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You should have that type of attitude. Hey, not what can I get out of this church? What can I give to this church? What can I, what can I do for other people? What kind, of, what kind of skills do I have? What can I do to help others out? Whether it be financially, whether it be with, with you know, your skills, whether, no matter what it's with. What can I do? That's the type of attitude we have because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's finish up here. Verse 36 says, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to have this this be a manner, have the manner that Paul had where um, people would know what type of person we are and that we're not just putting on a show either in church or, um, or anywhere on the job, dear Lord, that, um, that we can be the same, that we can be known, hopefully by doing good works for you, that we don't hold back anything that would be profitable um, unto people from your word, that we wouldn't be ashamed of your word, dear God, but we'd be preach it boldly and... Um, I pray that you would please just continue to build this church. Help us to find workers, dear Lord, people who, are, who have a heart and desire that, that understand that it is more blessed to give than to receive and that um, people have a, a desire to reach the lost and to preach the gospel, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just continue to bless our church as you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.